and then uh, and then I listened to him answer. And then you know what I did? I did something else that I do more of lately. I pulled out my truth pen, and I wrote what he said down. And I wrote that scripture that he thought of that I didn't even think of it connected. So that's what I want y'all to be involved here. And then your 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 real job, your real job. Everyone says, "Well, I got to get to work." You know. I, uh, we got to finish this meeting. I got to get to work. Well, your real job is your ambassadors. So that's, yeah, get to work. Go tell someone else about Christ that we're talking about. That's your real job. Yeah, but I'm a welder. Well, go weld to the glory of God and bring some sparks of Jesus in that welding, okay? Here, give this to that fellow. Come in the door, will you please? Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. and going into Saudi Arabia today oh with the gospel. Okay. Okay. So, wow. What do you think about that? Like that. Praise God. Thank you. So the awesome. natives, Abraham, he is carrying the gospel in with Praise teams, the Lord. Uh, with International Commission into Saudi Arabia. Well, I like that. That's uh, the big time. Okay, thank you, Jeff. All right. All right, so what we do in this group is we read the Bible together out loud every week. That's everybody open your mouth. Get your vocals going, and we all do this together, okay? It's one big family. This is a big ambassadorial meeting today. we got ambassadors from all over the place, and ambassadors that are in here today, come on up, Uncle Ron, I got your hand out, are going to take this word everywhere they go. You need to, here you go. There you go. And then, I got, he's got it, we got enough. And then, we go through these questions together, okay? So here we go. Let's start with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 through chapter 6, verse 2. Here we go. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is God's holy word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Context. How is every believer an ambassador? Before we answer that question, I would like to know what is an ambassador? David Miller. Ambassador Miller. What is an ambassador? He's still eating. Yet he raised his hand. <laughs> Pretty good. Oh, here, hand him that mic. Pop, 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 pop. We got Mike's, Sean. Uh, hey, let's thank Sean for putting all this. Man, this guy right there. Oh, my soul. Talk about star power. Welcome to Clean. Just came in the door. We got a handout for you, brother. Did you get, a, did you get one, Tessie? You guys in that sign, huh? Okay, go ahead. What, go ahead. All Jump right. In. Ambassador is a position that is appointed. It's not something that you take on yourself. All right? Wow. And the ambassador like that. has the full authority mm. of the people or person that has given that position. Whoa, I like that a lot. I hope someone wrote that down. I want to sit down and write down. Okay, you hear that? Ambassador, you hear the word ambassador, what comes to mind? Now let's give a review, think about your answer, get the hands up in a second. Let's do a little review. I found another L in there, guys. There are, listen, the, new, the, the, the ambassador the seven L's of an ambassador, okay? The first L we talked about last week, verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 5. The, new, the ambassador has a new lens. He sees things different. Paul said, from henceforth, I do not regard anyone according to the flesh, although I once saw Jesus according to the flesh. Cute little baby, philosopher, philanthropist, whatever I saw him as. But now we see him differently. So an ambassador sees everyone through a different lens. Everyone is either in Adam, dead in their sins, or in Christ, alive and redeemed. Everyone is either, like the old country preacher said, a saint or an ain't. 
The ambassador sees people as people that Christ died for. Okay? I just prayed for a corrupt, hell-bound politician on the way here in my car. That they'll be saved. That's their need. They can change their policies and look just like I look politically. But if their heart doesn't change, they're still going to go to hell. So an ambassador sees people. So we ask God, help me to see as an ambassador people through your little lens, through the eyes of Christ. Why does he see people? He has a broken heart for the lost, for Saudi Arabia, for the world, okay? So an ambassador sees through a different lens. An ambassador has a new life. Remember 517, quote it with me if you know it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. An ambassador has a new life. What else does the ambassador have? He has a new labor, right? Because all things are of God and who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So the ambassador has a new labor. He has a new language. What does verse 19 say? He's given us the word of reconciliation. He has a new language. He has the language of heaven. Do I hear heaven coming out your mouth? Yeah, it, yes, it does take words. The guy that said, you know, you know, Preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. It is necessary to use words. But make sure, the, the, make sure your lips match your life. But an ambassador has a new language. He speaks differently. And then what else does an ambassador have? He has a new Lord, and that's where we're going to go today. 5.21. And fi actually, 5.20, he has a new <clears throat> lifestyle because he's an ambassador. It changes everything. And then he has a new... Lord, verse 21, and then verses 1 and 2 of chapter 6, he has a new limit. So if you're writing these things down, by the way, the clock is ticking. You're not promised your next breath. We're going to close with that when we get there, okay, when we get to verse 2. So here we have, guys, some sacred ground. We have scriptures that a bunch of us have been quoting almost all of our life. Somehow you've heard these verses, and you're like, what do they mean? So we're going to kind of probe deeper, and we're going to plumb the depth lines of these verses one of which is, remember, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. We've been saying that forever. Last week, we went into deeper to what that meant. Another one is, God made him who had no sin. Verse 21, we're going to go deeper in that today. And then the other one is, behold, now is the day of salvation. We've been saying that forever. Well, what does that mean? What's going on? Who was God talking to in Isaiah chapter 48 originally when that was said? And then Paul lifted that and put it right here in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 6. So here we go. So. What is an ambassador? Keep coming at me. I love what Dave said. Someone who is, is commissioned, who is, is it's, it's, you are given, you are entrusted with this. You are empowered with this. It is not from you. It is from someone else. A higher, more powerful authority gives you that ambassadorial status. Okay? And he also said you're coming to represent that. What else is an ambassador? Real quick. Anybody, everyone. Go ahead. Okay. What's that? Spokesman for Christ. I like that. I like that. What else? Right over here. Yeah. Represent a foreign land. Give that to that fellow right there, will you? There you go, Dan, uh, Dan, uh, Bowers, uh, Andy. Okay. Represent a foreign land. Very good. What else, guys? Envoy is a good word. Responsibility. Yeah. You trying to almost sit down. Responsibility. Boy, that's a really good word. What else? Yeah, you got a lot going on there. You got war. You got decisions of conflict. You got economic issues. You have tariffs and you have trade and you have deficits and you have import, export stuff going on. What else does an ambassador do? You hear that word? What do you think of? Problem solver. Boy, I like that. A problem solver. I really like that. So an ambassador is a position of trust. Quote of the Thessalonians, how we've been entrusted with the gospel. <clears throat> you know, P Peter says in, 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 in 1 Peter, he says, we're aliens, we're foreigners, we're not of this world. So we're from another place. Guys, I hate to be the bearer of good news, but y'all ain't from here. <laughs> Paul says in... Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. So why are we getting so attached? Why are we getting so mad? Why is our blood boiling over things that don't matter? 
Why are we so consumed with things that are not heavenly? Why, how can we set our affections on things above Colossians 3, 2 and not on things of this earth? How can we lay up treasure in heaven where thieves can't break in and steal, where moth and rust doesn't corrupt? So I love this from the – this is right from the Secretary of, of, of our government website, the U.S. Government Embassy. Uh, good gracious. A bunch of them cooperating with the U.S. – all the branches of government here, reviewing communications – taking direct responsibility for the security of the mission, <clears throat> carefully using resources, serving Americans with professional excellence and highest standards of ethical conduct. So think about that weight of responsibility. Think about you just wa you walked into a country like India with one point plus billion people, and you are the American ambassador. Suddenly, you got a billion plus people that everything you say, everything you do, every mannerism, Every bad joke you tell, every dietary conniption you have, everything, every way you dress, every propriety of yourself or impropriety. So you cuss like a sailor, they're going to say, well, that, that, good old, that good old missionary guy over there, he cusses like a sailor. Well, that's how every American is. <laughs> Think about the gravity of that. One point, the mic is always hot. You're the ambassador. So that's what the, you know, so this is, so Paul says, look, he says, look, he says, God's giving you this, this labor, this ministry of reconciliation. He's giving you this message of reconciliation. He says, so to summarize that, that role, you have a new lens, you have a new life, you have a new labor, you have a new language, you have a new Lord, you are an ambassador. So you have a higher calling. You are called by almighty God to represent heaven on earth. To pray with Jesus, Luke 11, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> you are the embodiment of that. Okay, so why are we called ambassadors? This is kind of interesting. By the way, this is kind of cool. Uh, you know, some of the most gifted linguists, the most gifted linguists who have a gift of languages, okay, can speak and can pick up on the Slavic language. They can grab the, they can somehow grab these Nordic tongues and the, they can grab these uh, Asian tongues. They can just pick it up and figure it out, okay? I have a cousin that's like this, just gifted in languages. You know who some of the most gifted linguistic people are? Ambassadors. If, if you have that skill or that just God-given gift, I don't know how you do it. It's like people that can play the piano by ear. They just sit down and whammo. My daughter can do this. Just, they can just make those, those keys just sing and, you know, glow. Ambassadors have the gift of language many times. Why is that important? Because they can understand the language. When you understand the language of a culture, when you go to Lebanon and you can speak your language, suddenly you understand that culture better, right? You get in the fiber of the DNA. Yeah. So, but this is the convicting part of that. Ready? Ready? How's your language? How's your heavenly language? Do you have a different language? And I'm not talking about American. I'm not talking about, you know, Canadian, whether they, whatever they speak up there. Uh, well, or England. <laughs> uh, <coughs> So when I hear you talk, <clears throat> do I hear the language of heaven? Do I, hear the, do I hear the word? Do I hear something different? Man, that guy's got a foreign accent. Wouldn't that be a great accusation? He's got a foreign accent. He sounds like heaven. I'm hearing something that's not of this world. See? So when you represent heaven, you have a different language. And it's just an interesting uh, thought I had about ambassadors. So I, I just put that, that note there. And we're going to go to this next question. Every believer is an ambassador. Everyone say, I am an ambassador. I am an ambassador. So we got a lot of ambassadors in here today. Ambassador Jacob, and Ambassador Colleen, Ambassador Rock and Ronnie. <clears throat> we're ambassadors. But we're not just ambassadors, we're ambassadors for Christ. Everyone say, for Christ. For Christ. And this is how it works. As though God were pleading. Wow, look at that word. Everyone say pleading. Pleading. There's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of summoning, beckoning. Calling out, crying out. God, we're pleading through us. He's pleading through us. So his message is coming. First it comes to us in Christ. And it, and it fills us. And then he's pleading through us. And then he says, that Paul says, we implore you. That same intensity of that word. We implore you. We beg you. We plead with you on Christ's behalf. That is so important. On Christ's behalf. 
I'm not pleading with you and inviting you to be reconciled with God on my behalf. Don't, pr don't just pray this prayer for Stu's sake. Don't say, hey, someone, someone received Christ. Don't pray for this person's sake or for the sake of the mission agency. I plead with you on Christ's behalf. It's on his behalf. He's the one that came and saved us. 521, we're going to get to that. It's the next verse. We plead with people on Christ's behalf because Christ is the hero. He's the star, and he's the only one that can save us. And he's the one that came on the rescue mission. So Paul says, I'm pleading with you. God's pleading through you, and I'm pleading to you on Christ's behalf. And here's the message. I love these four words. These are four powerful words. I want everyone in this room to say these four words today to somebody. Be reconciled to God. Say it again loudly. Be reconciled to God. That is the message. If that is not coming out of your life and coming out of your lips and coming see, seeing through your lens, then you're missing the whole point of why you're here. If you're having a real bad day, invite someone to be reconciled with God. Because you're having a rough day, they're on their way to a burning hell. You think you got it bad? You think your problems are bad? Think about someone who has no Jesus. You are there for one sole purpose, to invite them to be reconciled for God. So get rid of these stupid skirmishes. Get reconciled with your brother. Well, I'm going to wait for him. Well, shut up and go talk to him. And go get right. You know, cut the garbage. Cut to the chase. Quit trying to build your brand. Build the brand of the Lord Jesus. I'm pleading with you on his behalf, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled with God, which motivates me to go get reconciled with my brother. To go say, look, I don't know what I've done. I don't know what I've said. You know, I don't care how bad someone has slandered you or whatever. Go to them. You know, there's something not right with us. We're supposed to be family in Christ. The Bible says if I say I love God and I hate my brother, then I'm not of God. His love isn't in me. Well, his love is in me. We're going to get this right, and it's really painful. And i got to swallow a lot of pride right now. But be reconciled with each other, because how can I reconcile people to a God if I'm not even reconciled with God's family? See? So it's real important. But the message is that. Be reconciled to God. Those four words change everything. <clears throat> so I just put this question here. Number th we're going to skip to number three. I put these out of order, which is not surprising. How are you reconciled to God? We talked about reconciliation a little bit last week. How are you, how have you been reconciled to God? By the way, who came to you and said, get right with God? That's all it is. Get right with God. Be reconciled with God. Larry tried to reconcile a whole bunch of folks. That's why God sent him for open heart surgery. <laughs> he was a patient described as an ambassador. Let me tell you why I'm really here. Why don't you do that next time someone asks you what you do? I'm an ambassador. You ain't lying. Unless God's lying. Okay? Go. Herb. Here, hold on. I think that's that. I think Larry's daughter posted a picture of him on Facebook walking down the hall of the hospital holding the Bible. He disconnected himself from what he was connected to yeah. medically and took the Bible down the hall. I saw a picture of it, Larry. So there Larry goes in, major heart surgery. We're all praying. We're like, wow, you know, heaven's a horrible place. Wouldn't want that to happen. But, you know, God, you're in control, you know, and we're trusting God to this guy back because he's such a blessing to us and you're in God's hands I mean you're facing what Paul faced earlier in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians we studied a couple weeks ago to be absent from the body is present with the Lord so I long to be present with him but I, you, you still have a lot of folks a lot of souls you God has you here to bless and save while you're here so he goes in for this major surgery and we're all you know putting the health stuff up he wants us to pray that God will open doors for him to share the gospel so you know walking around with that that nice gown with a big gaping hole in the back. Aren't those nice in hospitals? <laughs> he, he, I know he's got one hand behind him trying to wrestle that thing. And then he's got the other hand holding the Gideon Bible, reading John 3. And God loves you. God loves you. What's that little book you got? Well, I happen to have some more. Have you heard of a fellow named Gideon? He inspired us to put a bunch of these. In fact, those guys are crazy, man. They're putting these billion-dollar books in hotel rooms. I mean, someone's going to walk out one of those books one day and steal it. That's unbelievable. I don't know. Unbelievable. That's the best part of your trip, by the way. It's not the upgrade to the suite with the big bathtub and 
We got an upgrade the other day and when we went out to Reno and they put this massive bathtub in the room. The problem is it's like you walk in the room, it's right there. It's, it's like my wife's like, I don't, I'm not sure how we handle that because <laughs> supposing one of us is taking a bath and knock, knock, room service, yeah, bring it on in. Hey, you know, but anyway, but the best part of that room, you open the drawer, is a Gideon Bible. Get it out, read it. One dude put a $100 bill in a Gideon Bible to see if anyone would read it, and someone ended up did it, and they got 100 bucks. But they got treasure beyond eternity because they got God's word, right? Go ahead, Colleen, jump in. Hand on that mic, Herb, right, right behind you. He's got one. Uh, didn't Go. they say what happened in Reno stays in Reno? Uh, still. I think I like that. I should remember that before bringing that up. <laughs> Anyway, talking about uh, a louder for the folks in the back. yeah, talking about be reconciled to God. You know, our uh, partners in in ministry, especially with refugees, you know, people who are broken, they lost everything, they lost family members, they lost their homes. This is the biggest message to them. Tens of thousands of of people came to know the Lord through this message you know, about the reconciliation message. Because this is, this is it, you guys. It's, uh, just have to tell that story about what, what Jesus did on the cross. Right. And people are melted, you know. When, when you love on them, tell them you need to reconcile your hate toward the Syrian regime or the Russians, you know, the Ukrainians, because thousands of Ukrainians, you know, coming to know the Lord through this, this kind of message, you know. Amen. Oh, there was a brother in Christ yesterday who's seeing God's revival happen in Ukraine like he's never seen. He just got back, and he was blown away by the heart. He says, man, these people, because we have so much in America, and we have, we're in a peacetime here, but, man, these people are so close to Jesus. And he said, I was just humbled to be around these saints, worshiping God, military guys, worshiping God on their knees. So be reconciled to God. That's why he has us here, to be ambassadors. That is your full-time job. 24-7. And as Dr. Jeremiah said a few weeks ago, you don't retire from Jesus. It's like, how would that even work? You know, here you guys, he said the other night, we were up screening the new movie, Why the Nativity, which all y'all should go to, powerful gospel, scripture-saturated movie. Dr. Jeremiah's team, Paul, joined an amazing job on this movie. We were screening the Museum of the Bible. <clears throat> Dr. Jeremiah, who's, who's, you know, he's not a young buck. I mean, he's, he's up there. And he says, I just wish I could have done more. I, I wish I could do more for Christ at this age. I'm like, dude, most people your age are chasing the white ball, collecting seashells somewhere remote. You're out here making movies, bringing entire people to Jesus. But it was a challenge to me to say, hey, we're ambassadors. He takes it seriously. And he was challenging all of us in just in a gracious way to take that seriously. So, so anyway, I got some more. If you want more on this, you can, I can share this with you about the different things of ambassador. It's a great study. So here's the next question. How was Christ made sin for us without becoming sinful? That's verse 21. Everyone say 521. 521. 521. The goal is to circle back to this verse and some other verses the week of Christmas. Because I really believe the numbers of Christmas are 521. In this one verse, you have propitiation, imputation, substitutionary atonement, atonement expiation, imputation, forgiveness of sin. You have the whole panoply of salvation all chock full into this one verse that theologians call the Mount Everest of Scripture, 521. So get to know it, underline it, memorize it, read it, study it, read it again. And you might just be as close as you were when you first started looking at it. It's that deep. 521. So God made him go. A little louder. Hand on that mic, will you? You can, you can hand it over to him. Okay, you might have dropped your hat. I like that. Kill for Jack, the guys in the back need to hear you. This Christmas season is an example of how Christ was sinless, but he bore our sin. Uh -huh. Because he right. was impregnated in a virgin to, to God. Very good. 
it. Yeah. So we have the virgin birth. <clears throat> so God made him who had no sin. Very important. Also the doctrine of impeccability, which basically means Christ did not, did not sin, could not sin, would not sin. But he was tempted in all points just as we are, yet without sin. 4.14 of the book of Hebrews. So it's very, very important. So uh, <clears throat> we had to have a sinless Savior. Very fundamentally. I can't die for your sin. As good a guy as I think you are, and as good a guy as you think I am, I can't even pay for my own sin. So we need a sacrifice, a spotless lamb, an unblemished lamb. The, the same strict requirements applied in, the ex, in Exodus 20, 21, and all throughout there to the lamb that the Hebrews were offered for the Passover is applied to Christ. You got something, priest? Grab that mic. Christmas became real. The jail is open again, and we took our Gideon ministry in Monday night. And it's been a long time. It's been two years we've been waiting to get back in. And the only place open to us was the hole. The hole is the worst of the worst places in Davidson County. It's moldy. It's a story and a half below grade. The toilets are disgusting. It's beyond anything that any human should have to live in. It's going to be reconciled, but right now this is what it is. And 11 men are in isolation in the hole because of things they've done in public and things they've done in the community and then things they've done in the jail. This is the hardcore, crusty sinners, disgusting folks of society that we have to have a heart for. So we go down into the hole, and we're only allowed in this extreme barred area, and then there's a hallway, and then the prisoners are literally in separate caves, little prisons with more bars, and there's not lights in there, and the foul smells are dank. And God uses the message for Christmas, and 11 men... 11 men listened about Bethlehem Ephratah, the birthplace of Jesus. 11 men listened to the sheep's towers and how Jesus was born as a sacrificial lamb to be wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then they read with us aloud Luke 2. And as we went through this, 11 men got down on their knees and we got down on our knees with them. And all 11 said, I have to be saved. 11 men for Christmas. 11. But we weren't done. We're leaving. And there's a young man standing outside the magistrate's office, and he's waiting for his uncle to be released. And Fred is with me, and Fred says, hey, John, how about this guy? And we look, and we think he speaks Spanish, so we have a Spanish Bible and we're doing our level best murder in Spanish to try and get the gospel to him. And he says, well, I speak English. <laughs> and I said, but we had memorized the translations, so we didn't murder the translations. But he looked me right in the eye, and I said, do you want to accept Jesus as your Savior? He said, yes. We only had three minutes with this man. It's dark and cold and raining out there, and he's looking around waiting for his uncle. And he prayed to accept Jesus. So there's the 12th man. So when we're reading these passages right now, there is absolutely no mystery as to what's going on in our hearts. We have to be this one. We've absolutely, positively got to say, my sins are forgiven. I should be down in that dark hole. So I'll go to the dark hole, not because of I'm anything special, but because Every one of us knows someone that's living in a dark hole right now. There are 12 people. There are 12 people that you know that need to help out of getting out of a dark hole right now. And maybe you're one of them. This is our opportunity. This is our brother saying this right between the eyes. Be ambassadors. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Mm. So as you hear, even in the hole of a, a confined prison, the, the light of the gospel shines in brightly through our brother, 
as an ambassador. He went as an ambassador. Everywhere we go, we're ambassadors. And the message is the same. Be reconciled to God. You run out of things to say, just say those four words. Be reconciled with God. Get right with God. If someone doesn't understand what the word reconcile means, great. Let's talk about what that word means. Let's go deeper in those words. If someone, you know, quit being afraid of words. Use the words and get the questions and then answer the questions and drill deeper. So we say, we're ambassadors, we say be reconciled to God. Why? How does it look? What's it look like? What is the essence of everything we're talking about? <clears throat> How does God, a holy God, reconcile sinful mankind to himself? Verse 21, 521. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So we needed a sacrifice. We needed an offering. And our own, the, the law demanded it. So he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him or through him. So you have the language of in Christ and with Christ and in him over and over again and on behalf of Christ. So imputed righteousness, which we talked about last week. But see, not only did Christ have to be perfect, impeccably righteous, without any blemish, without any spot, but he also had to keep the 600 plus commandments of the law perfectly. So when you go through the law with someone like the rich young ruler who came to Jesus, I've kept them all from my birth. But what did Jesus do? He pressed them. Because they can, we can put on an exterior front that we've kept all the commandments, haven't stolen it. I can make an argument, and it's just interesting. You go through the Ten Commandments because the law is the, the law is designed to be preached to the heart and to soften the heart, to show you, to expose you to God, to say, "Look, I'm guilty." Okay. So, you, but if you want to go to the nuclear uh, uh, on the law, the nuclear option is, well, so have you loved God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength every second of every day of your whole life? I'll listen, and you talk. Answer, please. No. Very good. Yeah. So only one is worthy. Only one, only one not only <clears throat> abstained from and was perfect and never, neither did he commit sin, was any guile found in his mouth. But one kept every law, obeyed every commandment perfectly. And that in his name is Jesus Christ. And his righteousness which is an alien righteousness in Romans chapter 3. You read Romans 3 and 4, it goes deep in imputation. It's rich. His righteousness is imputed to us. It's counted to our account. And so let me tell you what you bring to the equation. Ready? Let me tell you what you bring to God. If you think you bring anything to God of a meritorious fashion, then you are in deep trouble. Deep trouble. Even the prophet said your, your, uh, your righteous works are like filthy rags in God's sight. So let me tell you what we bring to God. Well, let me tell you what I bring to the equation. Ready? I bring my sin, and I bring my guilt, and I bring my shame, and I bring my pain, and I bring my abysmal failures, and I bring every bit of hell that's in my life. That's what I bring to the equation. And let me tell you what he brings to the equation. Grace. Mercy. He brings his love, his righteousness, his perfection, his perfect birth, his perfect life, his perfect substitutionary atoning death. He brings his perfect resurrection, and he brings heaven, and God puts that on me. So it's as though on the cross God treated Christ. He didn't become a sinner, but he became sin for me in my place. So he put my sin and my guilt, Christ paid that perfect price on the cross, and God took, takes his righteousness and he puts that on me. And he treats me as a son. And he puts the robes of righteousness and clothes me with those. Is that not, can everyone say amen to that? Amen. So that is the great exchange. We're going to go deeper because that is the point of Christmas. So if you get through this month and you don't talk about that, then fine, pick it up in January and pick it up in February and every month, okay? 
because Jesus Christ came for us and he came to redeem us, to reconcile us to God so that we can go bring other people to God. So here we go. What's this look like? Verse 1 of chapter 6. We then, as workers, what is the great exchange? We talk about that. Why the urgency of now? We then, as workers, together with him. Boy, I love that. We are together. We are laborers. We are ministers. We are ambassadors. We are workers. This is, God is a working God. God is a creative God. God is an active God. <clears throat> okay? He's put a new creation in us. So Paul says, we're co-laborers with you. We're in this thing together. We're fellow harvesters. Yeah, for the kingdom. So we then, as workers together with him, our bond is with Christ, we also plead with you. So now Paul's saying, look, we implore the world, be reconciled to God. We're pleading with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. So what are ways that we receive the grace of God in vain? What are ways that we abuse the grace of God? Paul confronts one in Romans 6.1. What are ways that God's grace is taken in vain or abused? Anybody? Pride. Pride. What? Okay, yeah, thank you. We can send more. That's, the, that's the, the fallacy Paul addressed point blank about God's grace in Romans 6.1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead in sin live any longer in it? Why did Christ come? He died. He was buried. He rose again to bring us new life. Put to death the deeds in your flesh, he says in Romans 6. So receiving the grace of God in vain. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we missed. We've taken the scriptures, twisting the scriptures, listening to the wrong voices, listening to. To lies, false teaching. And, you know, and it all comes down, by the way, every heresy has its root in abusing the grace of God. You, I'm telling you right now, it's, it's got to be grace and. You've got to be baptized to be saved. got to do that. It's got to be grace plus. You gotta, it's every one of them. They add, they sprinkle something on. That's the great Galatian heresy. You know, we're, we're, you know, Paul says in Galatians 2, were you saved by the deeds of the law or the hearing of faith? It's one or the other. Either faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and faith is that great gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, or it's by your works. It can't be both. And you can't be saved by the law. The law will only condemn you and throw you in hell. It will expose you, and it will condemn you. But it's by grace you're saved. Jump in. Okay, okay. Yep, thank you. By grace are you saved through faith, and that saved not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, the second makes the most yeah. sense. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Hey, very good, yeah. So, the grace is from him, the faith is from him. So, Paul warns them. And by the way, we could spend a little more time on the context of Corinthians. We, you know, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, where there had been a lot of grace abuse in that, in that church, right? And we nod and agree, but we also on the inside realize, hey, there's probably a lot of grace abuse in my own church. In my own, you know, we all, we all have misappropriated, misapportioned, misplaced, and not properly valued the grace of God. And in the sense of what call, Paul's calling them to do as ambassadors, there's a sense, very real sense, this is very important, guys, and this is, this is now, I'm just going to talk to myself for a second here, okay? It's very important that we ask this question, how can I give away something that I don't have myself? Many of us could quote John 3.16. But have you, has your life been transformed by that Savior who came to this earth? See? So, I'm a, I am simply calling you to be reconciled to God because I am witness, case, exhibit one. He has reconciled me. And those who are reconciled, they say hurt people, hurt people. Reconciled people, reconcile people. So let's turn that, Okay? I know you got problems. I know you got pain. Jesus Christ came to transform that pain, not so you could be a dead end. Here's your pain. Here's you. It stops here. It just begins there. Because now you are sent and commissioned 
to go and bring other people to Christ. What he just did for you, get out there and do it. Go tell everyone what he did for me. See, I got to tell somebody. So Paul says, don't receive the grace of God in vain. Don't let it just hit you and then, okay, well, I'm saved. I'm healed. I'm forgiven. I'm going to sit on my blessed assurance and just hang out here in the holy huddle. No. Don't be a keeper of the aquarium. Be a fisher of men. Amen. Yeah. So follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So how's your catch? Who's on your hit list today? How are you baiting the hook? You better be loaded. You stay. I, Mom and Daddy got stacks of tracks all over their house. And don't go to their house and get them. Go get some yourself and give them to people. Give tracks to believers. Stu, why would you do that? I'm already saved. It's not for you, dude. It's for that waitress that you're going to give a big tip to at lunch. And then you're going to say, I know I gave you like 40% tip, but I'm going to give you this little booklet. The message of this booklet changed my whole life, and I can't go through the whole thing with you right now because you got eight tables, and you're a single mom, and you're going crazy, and the boss man is watching you right now. But just put it in your pocket and read it later. And I'll write the Christian radio station on the back of that sometime too. That's why she's your waitress that day. Not so you can get fat and eat too many carbs so you can share the gospel everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. That's why your car broke down, to lead those people to Christ. That's why that dude is sitting in the, in the lobby of the jail. So you can walk out the door and say, hey, wait a second. Are, are you human? Do you have a pulse? Do you have a soul? Do you have a heart? Do you have a mind? Whoa. Well, I have a Savior who came and died for this mind, this soul, this heart, and this pulse. I want to tell you about him. That's why I walked by you right now. Boom. That's why we're here. So. So the, the grace of God, use the grace of God in vain is, is, is letting it flow in you and then stop, okay, and not letting it flow through you and be an ambassador. Go, Kim, back there in the back. Hand on that mic. That's exactly right. Yeah. You know what? Amen. Thank you. You know, it's just, you know, how hard is it to tell someone God loves you? You know, I, I get on my kids for leaving stuff. I left my phone in the Uber with all these Bible study notes in it on when we were flying back from New York or from uh, D.C. on uh, early, early, early on Saturday morning. And the Uber guy takes off. My wife's taken off to get the baggage. I'm behind her. I can't find my phone. Before I'm looking for my phone, God convicted me and said, why couldn't you just tell that guy God loves you? I told him about my dad's radio station. I ran out of tracks. We were busy getting our stuff together. It was about a four-minute trip to the airport. We were that close. And, but God convicted me of that. Within milliseconds of that voice in my heart, I can't find my phone. My phone has this whole message on it about being reconciled to God. And so I yelled out, honey, stop. Don't go through security. Because you have all the Uber stuff on your phone. And so I have the Stuber stuff on my phone, but she has the Uber stuff on her phone. So anyway... So she calls the dude, and she somehow finds him, and he's so gracious. He circles the whole airport and comes back. Wow. And he's, he's got it. And, of course, we, you know, we left him a good tip and all. So I rush out. We're afraid we're going to miss our plane because the line's really long. I rush out, and I get my phone, and I look at that and I say, God loves you. <laughs> and he smiled real big. He's so gracious. Gave him my phone. I might have given him something. I don't know. I try to. I run out of gospel tracks, so I pull out my little Christian radio key pads, and I write the scriptures down. I say, read that. <laughs> Follow Jesus. You know, whatever I can. I'm in a hurry. I'm in an elevator, whatever. And I had my phone, and I went back in. But it was just kind of like the Lord reminded me, look, how hard is it to say God loves you? You know, how hard is it to say? I heard someone got saved on the streets of England and became a great evangelist. And someone said, how did you get saved? He said, because some random person who I could never find after that walked up to me and said, John 3.16. That's all he said. And then he disappeared. Maybe they were an angel. I don't know. But just, you know, how hard is that? But in, in your mind, you're in, being intentional, okay? So don't receive God's grace in vain. Share the grace. Spread the grace. Be a super grace spreader. <clears throat> Final questions here as we get going. Why the urgency of now? So we are pleading with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Verse 2. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Now, where's that from? That's from Isaiah chapter 48, verse 9. That's God talking to exiles on one of their returns to the Holy Land. 
And he's saying, right here, right now, I've given you grace. I've brought you back into the land. Don't waste it. Spread my name. Make much of the name of Yahweh. Sacrifice to me. Honor me. Have done with, put away with these false gods. And serve me only. Because now is the day of salvation. And that's what Paul says. This is the limit. We have the lens. We have the new life. In Christ, we have new labor in Christ as ministers of reconciliation. We have new language. We have the word of reconciliation. <clears throat> we have a new Lord. He is the greatest reconciler. He's the Savior, Emmanuel. And then, excuse me, this is the limit. We have a new, well, we have a new livelihood. We're ambassadors, a new lifestyle, but this is the limit. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Why the urgency of now, guys? Why is right here, why is that old cliche that we say all the time very true when it comes to God's grace? Finish it if you know it. There's no better time than the present. Let's say it again. There's no better time than the present. Why is that true when it comes to God's grace and salvation? Anybody have an illustration? Anybody want to talk about the excuses you gave for following God? Anyone have a sad story, a tragic story? that would relate to this. I'm going to sit down and listen. And we're going to close here in just a second. Lloyd, hand on that mic right there. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I was a secular Christian for most of my life until I got saved in year 2000. I'm a good guy. I got a big heart. I don't need Jesus. <coughs> and what I learned, Philippians 4.13, I got the first part right. I can do all things. Mm. And I lived my life that way until the year 2000, till I, <laughs> till I learned through Christ who strengthens me. Mm. Wow. Love that. Amen. Yeah, urgency. What happened? Why is now the day? Why? Why is it? Why so? Why the press? Why the pressure of right now? Go. Uh, everyone else, but this crime that took place—the four murders of those college students in Idaho—far removed from us, but it's ever present in the news. Present, but there's something about this case that really impacts me and haunts me in a sense because the finality of it, so you talk about the urgency of the presence. Everyone expected th those students to wake up in the morning to go to class. Yep. The one girl had already bought a car. She was scheduled to graduate in a week and start a new job in Arizona. Their lives were cut short. And without reason, without understanding, we don't know who did it. But what really strikes me is the fragility of life you don't know when that final moment is and when you think about who had the opportunity to witness to those four students were they witnessed to were they saved but it's a message to everyone you don't know how much time you have left and that is a wake-up call regarding your own children other youth adults all ages we are not promised tomorrow morning we're not promised tonight. Wow. Amen. Give me a good. That's a good word. We're not promised. That, that, and that murder of those kids was a wake-up call. Shocking. Hand that mic right over here to this guy here. There you go. Dwayne, go ahead, brother. Well, you know, they used to say, uh, a little louder for those guys. They, they used to say, here today, going tomorrow. But now it's like, here today and going 15 minutes from now. That's exactly right. That's why the now is so important. Yeah. Very important. Now is this. Hoover, go quick. going on and uh right. there was a rule that's been changed and i'll tell you why it would why it has been changed and that was that you cannot after scoring a goal or something like this doing something fantastic you can't take your shirt off anymore you want to know why it's because the brazilian team years ago when they won Every time they would score a goal, 
they would take their shirt off and it said, Jesus loves you. Okay, everyone, you know, underneath their shirt, they were witnessing to the world through that. So they changed that rule so you can't take off your shirt anymore. It had nothing to do with chest hair. It has to do with the glory of God that they didn't want there. And, but that just, and even though they closed that door, does not mean that you got to find another door. To witness, but I'm just saying that be open to God in many different ways. I put on the back of my jersey, had it sewn on, that Jesus is Lord. Amen. You know, so anybody who wants to, you know, see that, and and now that jersey belongs to a Palestinian no. goalkeeper who I gave to him wow. to wear, and so uh, he continues to wear that, and it has. Jesus is Lord on the back of it. Wonderful. To yeah. the glory of God. Praise God. Okay? Yeah. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Here, go ahead. You wish you got something. Here, go ahead. Well, <laughs> that's another excuse for me not to take my shirt off. But the uh, the thing that I was going to uh, say about this. Hold the mic away from you, but a little bit louder for the guys in the back. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. The Facebook can, but the guys in the back can. The Facebook can. So this is what I was going to tell you. I believe what gives me a sense of urgency right now is I believe that Jesus Christ is coming back soon. Mm. Right? I mean, you know, people have always said this, but if you look at what's going on in the world today, I really believe that Jesus Christ is coming back. And, you know, I, I think about this sometimes that, you know, what if I say, hey, I want to talk to somebody about Jesus. And I say, well, I'll do that later. I'll do that next week, next month. What if Jesus were to come back and I said, well, I never got the chance to witness to that person. You know, so that's what. That's an excellent word. Thank you, brother. Yeah, Bill, go ahead. That's a great word. Today is the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. There is a war going on. Yeah. It's between God and the God of this age, the world, and it's manifested by the behavior of people. But at the cross, God declared peace, and he allowed us to be ambassadors to bring reconciliation to the world, to come to, so that we, they can be uh, introduced to the kingdom of God Amen. in Jesus Christ. Amen. Reconciliation. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, guys, everybody stand up. We're done. Kaleem, jump in real quick as we wrap up. stand back to back and have our guns facing outward instead of facing each other and unify. Hey guys, so final two questions. Look, how are you imploring others to be reconciled to God? How passionately are you inviting people to come to Christ? Who are you going to implore today to be reconciled to God? Here's a good question. How is your ambassadorship? Do I see heaven all over you if I followed you around today? If I followed you home? I followed you to your job. Do I see heaven written all over you? Do I see heaven coming out of your mouth? Do I see heaven in all that you say and all that you do? So how is your ambassadorship? And here's this question. Why now? Why now? What, wh why should we invite people to Jesus Christ right now? I'm not talking about manipulating, coercing. You know, I'm a clever guy. I'm a salesman. I could talk someone into a lot of things. But I'm talking about why are we not inviting people to receive Jesus right now? When's the last time you look at someone and says, hey, why don't you just call upon the Lord and be saved? He's one prayer away. One prayer away. Why don't we ask, why don't we ask D.L. Moody, the great Chicago pastor, the great evangelist, consider following Christ. And then next week, we'll have a big invitation. We'll have a big decision. Little did Moody know that within days of that sermon, right in the middle of that week, has anyone ever heard of the Chicago fire? Most devastating fire maybe ever in history. Ruined millions, billions of dollars worth of stuff. Claimed the lives of thousands of people. Livestock destroyed houses and hotels and buildings. The great Chicago fire happened 
that week. And it devastated Moody. It devastated so much, he carried that with him, his whole ministry. On the 22nd anniversary of the Chicago fire, D.L. Moody said these words from his pulpit. He said, I never saw again many of those people that were in that church service with me that week. He says, I never again will make the mistake of not pressing people to decide right now to follow Jesus. And he goes on to say this. He says, I would have my right hand cut off rather than not invite someone to come to Christ right here and right now. Behold, today is the acceptable time. Now is the time of salvation. And so I say to you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, get on your knees. We'll get on our knees in this Dario, and we will pray together, and we will be reconciled to God right there with you. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the new Lord king. You want to talk about a, 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 a bunch of angels singing in heaven, you give your life to Jesus. There's joy in heaven, right, over one person that comes to Christ. So today, tell someone right here, right now, we're not getting over this table till you receive Jesus Christ. Invite them to. We don't force it, but invite them to, because now is the day of salvation. And we're ambassadors. We're, for, we're here to proclaim that message. Isn't that right? So that's my challenge. So you all are anointed, ordained, blessed, encouraged, to go out and live ambassadors of Jesus Christ, calling people to be reconciled to God. Brother Steve, close us in prayer. Will you come on up here? Maybe grab that mic right there so we can hear you. Thank you, brother. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just love you. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we just look at you, Lord, and, and just thank you, Lord, that you would love us, the sinners that we are, Lord. But you gave your only son, Lord. You prepared him, Lord, for our sin. Lord, you sent him. Lord, you introduced us to him, and you gave him to us. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to be your ambassador. We pray, Lord, that we would lift our heads. Lord, that we would seek every lost soul. We would touch every heart, our neighbors, our friends, our families, our co-workers. Lord, everyone within our sight, that, Lord, we may touch them with your word, your gospel. Father, just uh, initiate us, Lord. Send us, Lord. And may, Lord, uh, we just see great bounty through the harvest that you send us. Father, we love you, we praise you, and thank you for this time together. Be with us, Lord, as we walk, as we go through the week. We love you and praise you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pray with one person before you leave today.